Good morning. Uh, what is it, 7 a.m. if you're in Hawaii? And good evening if you're in South Africa or Europe, right? Uh, it's 7 p.m. in South Africa, right? Okay, awesome. On behalf of the International Society for Organization Development and Change, Stan Horwitz, Quang Lee, and myself, Kim Barker, I would like to welcome you to today's exciting webinar on digital disruption. Oops, sorry about that. Our presenter, Stan Horowitz, is a colleague and a dear friend. Clients, collaborators, friends often describe Stan as a warm, authentic, specialist, visionary with high levels of positive energy. I can attest to that. He is analytical and solutions focused with great business and people savvy. Stan loves having fun, but is also curious and serious. He is a positive disruptor. He is often rewarded wooden spoons by his clients. And I'm told that's because he's good at stirring the pot. Uh, but above all, he is a good poker player, or at least he thinks he is. Stan is an entrepreneur with vast consulting experience. Besides working at multiple levels with leading corporates, the public sector and government, he has worked at PwC before establishing the HR Outsource, which he sold in 2009. He then created the HR Network, a large consulting business providing leading solutions and services to many private and public sector clients. In 2017, Stan co-founded Neo Exo, which you will hear a bit more about in today's webinar. And in 2018, he has created the Singularity Company, an online venture in the UK, the details of which will unfold later this year. In short, Stan can be described as a futurist, business, organizational, and people specialist. He has already, um, he's a thought leader, an innovator, strategic implementer, guide, coach, and mentor. Stan holds a master's degree in commerce, is a recognized master HR and organization development practitioner, by the South African Board of People and Practices, and is also an internationally recognized OD consultant and a fellow board member with the ISODC. My co-host today is Quang Lee. Quang is a change strategist specializing in transformative organizational and leadership change efforts. Quang leverages his 17 years experience working with executives, leaders, and organizations to implement lasting change initiatives. His experience spans private, public, IT, and government practices. Quang's hallmark is his passion for helping leaders embrace a strategy for change that enables and fosters growth, learning, and performance by themselves and their teams. Welcome both gentlemen. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the session. Kimberly, thank you for the quick uh, introduction. Um, before I turn it over to Stan, I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, I've sent out chat messages for to every participant. <clears throat> uh, feel free to use the chat window to uh, dialogue with Stan. Uh, and, and ask questions. Both Kimberly and I will actually be reading the questions uh, during Stan's presentation at key points so that we can engage your questions directly to Stan uh, without having to sta having Stan to stop his uh, his uh, flow. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I just have one more thing to say before we go on. Yes, yes, okay. please. <laughs> well, first of all, I wanted to say I'm Kim Barker and uh, I'm the VP of the organization um, the International Society for Organization Development and Change. I teach at Eastern Michigan University and Cleary University, and I am the director for the Institute for Culture and Adaptive Leadership. I should say a director of the Institute for Culture and Adaptive Leadership. 
But um, I would also like to thank the International Society for Organization Development and Change uh, for hosting this webinar today. And I would like to encourage you um, to check out the ISODC. Membership benefits include uh, free access to the OD Journal, which is the most widely cited OD Journal in the world, access to um, OD newsletters, webinars such as this one, events, conferences, and other collaborative opportunities from all over the globe, special student opportunities, including uh, free membership if you are a full-time registered student, friendship and support from both scholars and practitioners in a collegial environment that will strengthen your practice. We have two conferences coming up this year. We have one in May in Perrysburg, Ohio in the USA and one in early September in Dublin, Ireland. We would love to have you join us for one or both conferences. For more information, uh, please go to isodc.org. And now, Quang, um, do you have some more technical reminders for us for the webinar? No, that's it. I'm ready to roll. <clears throat> well, so then we're gonna, we're gonna turn it over to Stan the man, right? So I guess I can step in now. Um, firstly, uh, just uh, welcome to everybody in the room and uh, certainly looking forward to spending the next hour with you all. Um, special thanks to ISODC, um, my collaborators, my board partner, partners and the board uh, for the special opportunity. And also, just, uh, it's really awesome to be with all of you all around the globe. Um, I know there are quite a lot that subscribe for the webinar. and. Um, I'm really thrilled to share some thinking with you and also just to hear your views and let's have a as, as best as possible an interactive discussion uh, in the next hour or so. So I uh, just uh, really thank you for, for this opportunity and just to a uh, uh, leading thought which I really entitled the, the presentation and the session is really the disrupt this disruptive discomfort of dual business models and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by dual business models um, and also the fact that we are almost challenging our comfort levels and it becomes disruptively discom discomforting in the process um, with all the technology, all the advances in technology and with all the disruptive technologies, it requires us to be and to think and to act very, very differently. And we're going to share that in the session. I thought what would be useful just to kick off with is just a little bit more context about me, I say, if I could because it explains uh, quite a lot around our philosophy and our vision around shifting, using technology, how we use it for the betterment of humankind. And given the changes that we're experiencing and going to be experiencing and the exponential rate of these changes, it's really important that there's a philosophical movement that underpins the future of work and how humans are going to show up in that, in that very difficult and challenging space. Um, but equally so, it's an extreme exciting space. So I just thought I'd like to share a little bit with you a bit around how we, how we see the world.
So what we're going to cover in this uh, webinar, uh, a couple of key themes that I think I'd like us to explore. The first one is really to look at the whole concept of change and how change itself is actually changing. We're then going to look at the what I call the new uh, language of business, uh, technological disruption and moving into singularity and how this new language has actually emerged in particularly, I'd say, strongly so in the last two years in particular. Uh, we're going to look at the change effect in different economic sectors and look how these changes and these technological opportunities are actually shifting industries and different economic sectors across the globe. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to look at disruptive discomfort and the dual business models. We're going to look at the exponential nature of change and the expected impacts and responses of the C-suite. So how are all these changes affecting the C-suite and what, what does it mean for them in their current business models? And equally so, what does it mean for them in the future people models that are going to change as the business models change? We will look at the role of OD and the HR executive and how that is uh, really, really shifted and is shifting. Um, and I think this is a global uh, move that is actually starting to take place more and more. We'll also explore the, how the HR function is going to need to change and act in order to enable this kind of future uh, and move beyond transactional HR, even beyond strategic HR into really strategic business mode. And finally, look at, if there's time, some new value propositions and offerings and that will shift the nature of work and work models. And um, those are the themes that we're going to be covering in the webinar. And so I thought I'd like to kick off a little bit to look with us looking at how the world is shifting and changing. And if we look at the curve of the development of technology specifically from the 1900s through to 2020 and leading into singularity, you know, years ago when the computers were introduced, buildings hosted massive, massive spaces of computer space. And today we're literally able to take that same amount of data and information and have access to everything around the world in a digital and through our cell phones. But not only through our cell phones, our cell phones themselves are adapting into new modes of electronic media and different ways of um, enabling us not only just communicate, but enabling us of ways to relate differently to the world. And all of that is leading us into a space which is called the singularity. So I thought what would be, would be useful for one at the moment is if we could just, and uh, Kim, if we could just find out from the room, how many of you are familiar with the term singularity and know anything about what singularity is? If we could just have a feel from the room and just some, perhaps some people in the chat room which could just uh, give us on a scale of one to five, five being really experienced in the area of singularity or understanding at least the language that's moving to it. And for some of, for those that are perhaps hearing for of the terminology for the first time or not so familiar with it, maybe a one or two. We're, we're just so we can understand of where most people in the room are um, relating to, to the world of singularity. So Stan, we have had ever, every number from one to five. <laughs> and, and how many ones and how many fives, Kim? <laughs> majority um, fives, majority fours, threes, twos, ones. You know what, I think we've had more ones and more fives and, uh, and then a, a, a smattering of in between. Okay. So, Roland, so me... Roland, our president, is a two. Okay. <laughs> Not to so, call anybody so, out or anything. <laughs> So singularity is the, the singularity is the point at which computers is predicted by the by the time by 2045, 2050 around there, that computers will be able to generate their own programming. In other words, computers will be able to program other computers. And through a process of deep learning and, 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 and self-learning and self-reflection computers will learn differently about themselves in order to create different forms and different ways of being. So singularity is that point of crossover when we don't need humans to actually com program computers, but the code itself will be generated by computers themselves. And at that point, the relevance of humans in the world of technology starts to become questionable because the new technologies that are evolved will also be involved, evolved through areas or things like artificial intelligence, which is already happening. So that is the point of the time that is called singularity. And if we look at what leads up to it and some of the things currently taking place in the world at the moment, from uh, Tesla, driverless cars, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, things like Uber, we, we all know, robotics, 
um, wearable devices that are now moving across, you know, not just uh, devices that we're actually going to hold in, ha ha hold in our hands, but actually wearable devices that are actually going to enable us to augment our reality and feel the reality around us through to drone technology. Kim's husband was in South Africa recently and did some amazing shoots with the drone around South Africa. And all of this stuff, including uh, nanotechnology, big data, biotechnologies, cryptocurrencies, which are underpinned by blockchain, um, all these different words are shift or, or technologies are shifting us towards a place of singularity, that one point where businesses will be driven by computers that are generating new technologies themselves. So the, the shift that we've seen, all of this language in itself is shifting what we know and how we realize and recognize the world from 3D printing, which is affecting the manufacturing process. You know, supply chains are being disrupted in the way that supply of parts, for example, in the automotive industry can take place at the source, at a dealer principal or at a dealership itself. It doesn't have to come through across the world through 3D printing, where it's shipped and, and uh, moved across the world. A virtual reality changing a lot of what we know in the education world and bringing in different forms and alternative modes of learning, the way we see things, the way we do things, through to even our own physical beings being trans transformed um, through gene therapy, um, people being able to select specific genes to create their model baby that they want to create. Um, so we're moving into a very, very different space, and every industry with all these different words that are on the screen that are put together are being shifted. In the financial services sector, as an example, um, things like cryptocurrencies are radically changing the way we see traditional currencies and the, the traditional way of, of transacting and monetizing and paying for goods and services. So things like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Ether, um, Ripple, and there are a whole host of what are called alternate um, uh, cryptocurrencies actually change the way we transact and we cut out the middle man, so to speak, the financial institutions. So there's often a, a, um, a lot of legislation that all companies, countries are looking around the world at legislation in order to try and get a control over what's going on using these cryptocurrencies, which is almost a form of regulation, which is anti um, disruptive. But as soon as something's, you know, legislated, there are new ways that um, go around it um, in order to enable it to happen in any case. And similarly with Uber, um, I was in London two weeks ago, and Uber, I'm sure, is in South Africa, it's very commonly used, and I'm sure it is in many parts of the world. And London at the moment is looking at banning Uber because it's disrupted the nature of the traditional taxi industry. And so there's a big uh, legal hassle, hassle going on between Uber and um, the taxi industry in, in the UK who want to ban the technologies. Ultimately, there's no stopping the development of technology. Technology is disrupting everything that you do and it is going to continue and it's going to get happen at a faster and faster rate and more and more exponentially. So in certain businesses, for example, we've had linear growth as opposed to exponential growth. And the linear growth has been a plotted, planned process at which growth has taken place and businesses have grown from micro to medium size to large to, to international size businesses over a period of time. With the event of Airbnb as an example, we don't need uh, and an app. Um, the hotel industries are being disrupted because people in their homes are actually able to rent out their rooms and still have a source of income directly through an app. So hotel bookings are being affected globally because the um, disruptive technology is in fact changing the industry. So in every industry, the world around us is changing and all of that is shifting us and requiring us to transcend what we do, to move beyond what we do in a way that we don't know, not just transform and change the shape, but actually move into something completely different towards the era of singularity. And of course, that is going to have major impact for our CEOs and our executives, but equally so, it's going to have huge impact for people, people models, OD and HR executives. So how is change changing on a personal level? We spoke a little bit about CRISPR. I spoke, we mentioned on the previous slide, CRISPR and genetic modification within our human beings. There's a project on the go in, in Russia, which is called the 2045 uh, Strategic Social Initiative, which um, is in essence re-looking at how the form that humans actually take 
in their current being. So if we think back to the evolution of humans, um, and whether one believes in evolution or, or not, I'm not going to go there, but the fact is we have evolved over, over thousands and thousands and millions of years into the form that we know right now. With the advent of artificial intelligence um, and the replication of our um, being, we're at, scientists are currently working on ways where they're actually able to take our brain power and replicate our brain power. So every memory that we've had from, from our birth through to where we are right now can actually be downloaded into an alternate form. And the view is that we can actually, if we can move beyond just extending life through bio, biogenetics, which we are already a wrong way to do through Stelsim uh, research, et cetera, the new way will actually be to be able to take the human form into an alternate form um, and therefore prolong, create what humans have been longing for forever, which is longevity into an eternal being. This is really where we are headed. Now, whether this takes place by 2045, 2050 is possibly semantics, but the reality is at some point in our trajectory, we are for the first time able to craft our own evolution and plan our own evolution as a human species to become something that is different. So our minds are going to receive new bodies or new beings into things or ways of being that are different from a human form. Um, almost like, uh, I don't know, how many of you have ever seen the movie Avatar? Just a quick uh, poll or question to the room. How many of you have seen the movie Avatar? Uh, we're getting responses. Mm -hmm. Many people have seen Avatar. Okay, so many of you have seen Avatar, so you understand the concept and even uh, the Matrix concept of living in dual worlds and, and parallel universes, et cetera, et cetera, and Avatar moving into a different alternate form. This project is actually almost the Avatar project, which will then shift us into new forms of being. And the belief is that we, or I believe we will call it almost a humanitar species. So we're almost in the process of designing, not just organizations that are going to be different, workspaces, businesses that are going to be different, but people that are going to be different at a time when we're actually able to take our, our brain power, augment it with um, artificial intelligence, take it in and all our memories and everything that we have into an alternate form and being, which is really quite phenomenal. By 2045, we might literally be able to plug in to a different source. Now, for many people, this sounds as though it's like serious science fiction. And I know I often get this, is this guy smoking something or what has he been smoking? Um, or give me some of that good stuff. But really to say to you, honestly, if you do any research of what's going on at the moment, you will see that this is the reality of where research is actually heading uh, as far as humans are concerned, but also the evolve, evolution of the disruptive technologies. So as much as legislation tries to fight it, and there's a big debate, for example, on artificial intelligence, whether there should be a regulatory framework to prevent the negative effects that can emerge out of um, artificial intelligence going into the wrong hands of people who might use it for the wrong purposes, as opposed to using it for good and for growth and for development and for the betterment of humanity. Um, those frameworks are going to be really, really critical. And therefore, it's important that we're not talking about just business and organizations, but we're also talking about business, governments understanding what is the meaning of these disruptive technologies that Ray Kurzweil has said are leading up to the singularity, that single point in, in being. So the avatar project specifically has five, five avatar modes. Um, where we are at the moment, it's really looking at a robotic copy of the human body and remotely building into that remote robotics. So we often see, we've already seen the robots and the emerging, and I'm sure many of you have seen the YouTube clip where the guys are flipping backwards, the robots are able to flip themselves backwards, and we see some of the robots taking on uh, human uh, language as, as, as a way of communicating, even though that is programmed and it's coded. As soon as deep learning starts to take place and, and machines are able to learn from their own code and their own language, they're able to self-correct. And so that language becomes more interactive and more, more um, real. By 2025, it's predicted that an avatar, the human brain will have been replicated. And I believe that scientists are not very far from this process of replicating human brains and will be able to be transplanted into an alternate form, into an avatar form. By 2035, the project aims to have an artificial brain with a human personality. Because the biggest thing that people say, obviously, is it's all very good. You can transplant memories and, and things that are, are, are um, 
you can't transplant personality. How do you transplant soul? How do you transplant personality into something? So the the deep learning that's going to start to take place with, within avatars and with the, within the way the, the model works is that that learning is, of personality is going to be rooted or learnt from the source of what that personality profile looks like. And the belief is that that will be translated into eventually into a hologram. So that the um, avatar body and form will eventually take the form of an avatar. Quite, quite uh, amazing space to think about that in 40, 50, well, 20, 25, 30 years time, we might be sitting as a hologram in some little body in somebody's hand and a whole life history might be there because we might have moved on. So we might be in an artificial form having transported our brain power into a supercomputer and therefore with all the implants that we are going to by definition have as part of our bodies, not just going to be augmented, but we're actually going to have implants in our bodies, which will be able to transfer. Not everybody's going to want to do it, but it's a possibility. Stan? Any questions up from the room? Yes, Kim. Stan, um, Bina has a question. She says, computers use code. What is considered the aspects of human brains this is referring to? Cognitive, uh, emotional, instinctual, intuitive? I would add spiritual. And, 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 and I think that is the point. At the moment, it's more around the cognitive space, but as technology is advancing, it will move into the other forms, the other components of what it means to be human. So the very nature of what we understand of being human today in the physical form and or other might very, very well change in that crafted evolution as it transpires. So the mix of the robots or the, um, the human bots coming together with the human form might be very, very different from the way we know it in the physical form initially. That might take on a mechanistic process initially in terms of cognitive abilities, but later on the, uh, the emergence will, will take place with um, different forms of, of, of thinking around, uh, around being in terms of emotional components. And the spiritual, I'm, I'm not sure, because spiritual often refers to purpose and what the higher order purpose is. So we can have a debate around this for, for many, many hours. Um, but this is where the world is moving in, in a large sense. Not just the avatar project, but the singularity part, I think is the most important part. The part where computers actually are able to come to program themselves and program um, robotics in, in, uh, in different industries or different forms. Stan? Uh, yes. Ross has said that he could use some of this uh, visionary technology on his PC today. Yeah, absolutely. Can yeah. you, I'd love to know. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and all, there is also a question. What does this really mean to business, Stan? We're going to go there. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to go there very soon. Okay. So, and one last question. Yeah. Um, um, Laura is wondering, um, how, how will transplants be done? Out of curiosity, is there an ongoing research that looks into hooking up a computer with a brain? Yes. So the answer is, yes, there is research that's going on in terms of transplants. You're talking transplants of the human brain or transplants in human biology as a whole? I, well, I, I think it's related to the brain, if I'm reading the question okay. properly. So there are different, different ways that bio, that, that, that bio uh, tech is, is actually taking place at the moment. So, for example, if you combine a lot of those texts that we spoke about earlier or that we mentioned earlier, you could take um, a digital printing process and be able to print a human part. And it's already being done, where human parts are being printed via 3D printers and are actually being implanted through the printing process. You don't actually necessarily need a, a, another human's part in the way we actually transplant human's uh, parts into our current, current human body. So that's one of the shifts they're taking. In terms of the brain, it's um, once the brain has been replicated um, into a, from a computer, I don't know how the process is going to work, but there will be some way of downloading that into, into content. So there was something, something that would probably have an artificial way of reading our cognitive abilities. So from my earliest memories, from probably most of us remember from the age of three years onwards, and those memories are stored. Sometimes they're in consciousness and often they're in unconscious uh, processes or unconscious uh, being, but the, the, those would come, come um, be transported into a, into a, parallel system or computer system. The technology of how it works, I'm not actually the genius on how that, uh, to be able to explain it, but I'm sure there are, there are ways to research it. The reality is that these things are starting to happen. There are projects on the go around them. 
and this is where the world is moving to. And so we move to the so what's of all of this. And the so what really says that the language of business is actually changing. The language that we use in business is moving towards disruption and singularity. And more and more executives are starting to say, when do we jump on this curve? When do we, when do we actually start this process of disrupting ourselves? Our business models are working. We're making profits. We do reasonably nicely. Why do we need to change? And the question is, what happened to Kodak? What happened to Uber? What has Uber done to the taxi industry? What has Airbnb done to the hotel industry? What has robotics done to manufacturing? So the question is not so much about when we need to climb on, but or whether we need to climb on rather, but when do we need to actually adapt and how? And that requires us really looking at a whole a digital strategy, a whole migration strategy, and understanding that we need to implement multiple layers of complexity into the implementation of our, 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 of our, of our digital um, strategies and allowing them to evolve and grow. So the new business of language, I really believe, is really more around the technological disruption and singularity. I do believe, by speaking to the spiritual quotient that you spoke about earlier, I believe every business has a, has a purpose, and that is its, 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 uh, its what I call the SQ, the spiritual quotient of the business. And I think more and more executives are going to have to start really defining what is their purpose. Where, why are they there? Moving away from just we're here to make money. Um, a lot of in, in Canada at the moment, there's an experimentation where many of these let's call them menial jobs, are being taken away. Call centers are being disrupted, for example, uh, via call, call center technology through, through uh, voice recognition, through voice programs, computer programs, actually able to answer questions instead of a call center operator. The question is, what is our purpose as a business? How do we show up in the world to make an improvement? And do we want people to be doing menial jobs that are labor intensive and boring that don't help anybody to actualize anything other than to be a means of production, so to speak, in a, an old Marxist kind of way. How do we allow people and create work environments and spaces where people can actually move and achieve their full potential and excel and love doing what they're doing? So purpose to business is really, really important. That spiritual quotient has to tie in with the individual's purpose. What is that individual's purpose into, in order to move forward? The question then comes, if all these things disappear and all these jobs start to disappear, and, not, and many of them are, as we just look at the language of, of the kind of jobs that are emerging now, as what uh, the titles of, of jobs that are emerging now that were not even conceptualized four or five years ago, and how current jobs are actually falling away, including doctors, um, who, where operations can be done by robots and can be done by in remote, remotely, not only, or even using technology remotely by, by a doctor. We're starting to shift all this kind of thinking. The question is, where do our markets come from? Where do our goods and products get sold to? You know, people aren't earning. And so there's a, a movement that's uh, started uh, across the globe, and it's particularly, I think it's been started already in Canada, which looks at a basic subsistence wage or basic wage, which frees people up. So there's a basic uh, living in order to start pursuing the things that actually articulate and speak to their higher order, level order work, and the kind of things that people want to, to be doing, rather than things that they, then they are forced to do um, in order to, to maintain a living. And this speaks very much to what we call the digital divide between the developed world and the underdeveloped world, and something I did a presentation on recently on digital colonialism, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So I'd like us to go to the chat room quickly and say, you know, we've spoken about some of these things. Some of them are maybe a bit further off than we think. Uh, the reality is they are all in, in the process of making. And let's, let's look, look at the different them. sectors. And say in those sectors and looking at any of those sectors, I'd like to ask the chat room to, to let's, let's take any of those and just ask anybody to put question one or two of those and let's, we can't explore them all, but let's look at how those, some of those sectors are being disrupted. Maybe I can give some insights and we can share a bit of thinking around that. So anybody just put so anybody in the chat room just want to look at one of those economic sectors and how it's being disrupted. So, so Stan? As when I was checking my son in at the doctor's office last week, uh, there was a check-in kiosk that had just been delivered and was still under wraps, literally right next to the desk where the young lady was checking me in. Right, right. So, so that role of checking you in has been displaced by almost by a program or a mechanism to do that for for you. That that role is disappearing. Yeah. So. Um, 
Sello ha is asking, what will that mean to healthcare? Okay, so, well, there's a whole lot of things in terms of healthcare. So if we take in, in, in for example, and how these things cross over, how these technologies could potentially cross. So we can look at healthcare at, at different levels of advancement. Um, healthcare per se is going to be extended. So the longevity of people will be extended through the technologies that are actually taking place. So as technology is advancing, more and more solutions, stem cell research is, is, is um, becoming more and more advanced. More and more of the solutions, the transplants I spoke about a bit earlier, you know, through, um, through reproduction of, of, of digital printing is able to produce parts of human parts that are being implanted. So all of these are being are, are changing. Doctors are actually able to operate in ways that are actually using robots and able to sit in different parts of the world and start to use those robots to actually perform surgical operations. So healthcare is a massive area. So it could be from, Kim, as you're saying, from the reception point to somebody entering into a hospital through to where they treat it. How these things cross over these different technologies, just even from a distribution perspective and, and looking at pharmaceuticals and medicines, as an example, and using some drone technology, and drones are being used to distribute uh, medicines in very difficult parts of the world that are not easy to reach. So drone technology is actually able to, to, to take a pharmaceutical product to people who need them in rural clinics, for example, in different parts of Africa, and actually get medicines that are life-saving medicines to people quicker than any road could do. Often there isn't access via roads, or certainly not solid, decent roads. And so the whole distribution mechanism within um, within within uh, healthcare is actually changing as well. But in essence, how it's going to change is are we going to be living for longer in our physical form, firstly, and then eventually into different forms. And we're already seeing how the age has shifted. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 70 or 80 was considered really old, and certainly 70. And now 70 is not so old anymore, and people are certainly living well into their 90s and into their hundreds. So actual age is being, um, as, as advances are taking place that are, are quite radical, is actually being extended on the only longevity. Stan, um, Tom has a question, more of a statement and a combo statement question. Uh, it's, a, it's a long one, so I'm going to read it to you. Uh, this opens up a huge philosophical problem. As some companies want to make proprietary closed source code, we have a problem. If the code is closed source, then the company controls the user. We must work that all uh, code in this area is open and free as in relation to the GPL. Uh, we already have this problem in implanted medical devices that the user cannot have access to the code. Also, the Federal Drug Administration in the United States does not review code as part of the medical device approval process. Yeah. So I would agree with everything that Tom has said. It was Tom that raised the question. Um, I would agree with everything that he has raised. I, I think that the source of coding is going to be and, and where, who owns the code, who owns the technology is really, really going to be important. This speaks to purpose of that organization. If it is to control and to... Uh, limit the well-being of humanity, then we're in for a negative form of disruption that's actually going to create a future that is actually not going to be good. And many people feel that that is the problem, that artificial intelligence, for example, is one of those unmanageable things. In, in Dubai, they've appointed a minister of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to deal with the issue of artificial intelligence. And in South Africa, they're trying to think of what artificial intelligence is sometimes, <laughs> um, because uh, some of our ministers are not that... Uh, <laughs> Awesome. I think you've got the same problem in the States with some of your leadership as well, but I won't go there. So, <laughs> but, so uh, Stan, yeah. Tom um, added a couple of links in the chat room uh, yeah. for further reading, so uh, folks awesome. might want to uh, take note of that. And awesome. uh, Jeremy has raised his hand. Yeah. And so um, do you have a question, Jeremy, that you would like to ask? Yeah, I appreciate you letting me chat out, <clears throat> talk. Yeah. I was having trouble uh, getting what I was trying to ask in the chat window. Um, there's advantages. No, 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 it's not your fault. It's mine. There's advantages to the disruption. Like you were talking about Stan with Uber creating opportunities for, for example, for me as a blind person to be able to more easily travel where I need to. Um, and, but there's also this, there's a byproduct of that. Kim, you were just talking about the check-in kiosk. 
-hmm. And there are some doctor's offices in Northern Virginia where that is your only option. When you get to the doctor's office to check in via kiosk, which ironically is not accessible to uh, a person who can't see. Same thing with the social security office, for example. And so how do we go about, you know, kind of anticipating those challenges and being able to really think through how, you know, Google Maps creates an advantage for somebody to get around, but it also, you know, presents challenges. Jeremy, I think those are awesome questions. And I think it, it, it ultimately goes to the work that we do and our roles. Um, and I'm going to get to that role of the, the role of the um, HROD practitioner in terms of um, acting as change agents. And in that change agent process, it's really about articulating how that, let's call it the diversity impact, is actually going to be uh, impacted in this process. So how do we, the, the, the exact outcome in terms of purpose of these technologies should be to create a world that is better not a world that's worse so sometimes there might be the unintended consequences but through the strategic planning process that we do with clients and we're actually able to assist uh, people in the thinking it's about how do we actually use this to sustain our purpose what is the purpose of the organization if not to create those improvements if, if it's just to make profits we've got a problem okay stan yeah um, I cannot believe it is almost 45 past the hour. Can you I know, believe I to move on. <laughs> it's taking that long? So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you that time reminder. Well, thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim, because this goes hell of a fast. <laughs> so, just moving to the, 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 the disruptive discomfort and dual business models and what I'm referring to. So, businesses have grown in the linear manner, which has taken over time. The growth has been, many of them either make it or don't make it and, and able to adapt over time. But the changes have been more micro. And in the old OD terminology, it would be more planned processes of change, understanding an as is and a to be and a gap analysis and moving an organization from there to there in a five year time frame. Well, those that, that times have gone because by the time you wait five years, everything has been disrupted already. So with the disruptive uh, curve, we, if we're able to understand what the disruption means and what the opportunities are for businesses in terms of their business model growth, we're actually able to understand what it means to create, create exponentiality. What does exponentiality mean? It means that without assets, an Uber startup doesn't own any, any vehicles, and Airbnb owns no hotels, it owns no rooms, and yet we have global businesses that everybody knows within five years, and five years ago, nobody had heard of them. Whereas other businesses have taken 30, 40, 50 years in order to go attain that. So understanding where that opportunity gap lies between linear and exponential in the business model is actually what allows us to shift um, businesses towards their, their growth and, and being able to deliver their services and their products in different ways. And also finding new products and services to deliver based on the purpose statement that I spoke about earlier. I call the linear model business as usual with normal increments of improvement, obviously efficiency, effectiveness improvements, but not necessarily significant radical change, which is really found in the exponential space. And um, the exponential space is really the space that actually allows us to transform and to transcend into a different form. And it's not an either or, it's a both and. What do I mean by both and? It's not either that we need to be exponential or linear, we need both. You cannot just shift to the exponential without the linear because the linear is what is in place at the moment. And we cannot ask our executives to think about a world that is completely foreign to them in from what they know without understanding that the current has to be included because the current is where the money is coming from, where the source of the future is going to come, of, of, of their current operations are, is coming from. But the future is actually taking a, a pace um, that is way, way accelerated from anything that we know. And so the models of OD and, 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 and um, HR execs and the people models are going to be implemented. Millennials, I read a stat today that 50% of millennials in the States are already working freelance. They do not want to be working for one company. One of our clients presented at a Disrupt HR function that we hosted recently. And uh, she, she basically said that, you know, what, what are we doing with this 45 hour work week thing? You know, why have we got this full-time employment model still in businesses? I would suggest those models are going to change radically as we move into creating new business models and new people models. So what does the C-suite need to do now? What do our executive teams and our executives need to do now? 
So before we can explore the roles of of uh, our, 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 our uh, sorry of our early people and, and our HR execs, I just want to share with you that we, what we need to do is help them to think differently about their business. And there is, and I'm going to end off a little bit later by talking about how we can go about doing that in our OD and HR executive roles and in our consulting roles, whichever form of space we have to be able to shift the language of business. But in order to that, do that, I think it's very useful just very quickly to look back at where OD's organization development has specifically come from and, and how it's evolved over the period. And I almost want to suggest that OD models are being Ubered and that Uber is being Ubered. So our old OD models, the way we know about plan predictability and the way the OD models have emerged over the years have been mapped by the business growth themselves. So a lot of the models that we used and have used that have grown out from the 50s have actually, in, in, in early days of OD in its own development and its own um, progress has been a linear process. And I think that the kind of models we're going to see are going to be disrupting themselves as, a, as an OD profession and also as an HR profession. And I believe that OD and the HR executive are very, very closely aligned. Um, and I'll share with you a little bit why I'm, I'm saying that a bit later. So we're going to shift from a current perspective of OD, which says that we, and we all understand that our current, most current model says we're involved in a world complexity, a world of VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, uh, unpredictability and change. And it's transformation and systems thinking that everything ties together. But we haven't actually thought how the business systems tie together. How does artificial intelligence relate to virtual reality, relate to, um, relate to nanotechnology to produce something new? Has anybody ever thought of that? Have we ever thought about how we can apply across the technologies a business model that actually changes? So that era... Um, will bring us to an era of what I call an era of transcendence where we need to prepare and guide individuals, leaders, or, uh, organizations, individuals, governments to harness the technologies to create their future and, for the, and again, I'm underlying for the benefit of humanity. And I think that speaks to what the chat room has been saying about the need for this in, for the betterment of people and, and humankind. The historical models of OD, and I just want to quickly go through this. We think from the 50s, we had laboratory training. Funnily enough, we are going back a little bit to some laboratories in our experimentation with some of the, um, some of the disruptive technologies. But the laboratory thinking was a linear model, which basically said causal, A causes B, therefore effect is C um, kind of thinking. Moving through to action research, moving to an action research survey feedback, analysis, design, get feedback, intervene see how what the changes intervene again. Those are the kind of things that have kind of emerged from an early praxis perspective. Um, through to participative management, the whole process of bottom up, involvement of people, engagement of people in the models, um, quality of work life, and moving more recently to the complexity st strategic thinking and systems thinking to where we are at the moment. But the sixth stream is really what I call from now onwards is the stuff that we don't really know. It's going to emerge and it's going to emerge fast. Um, and if we look at the history, just quickly, again, of, of different types of things that were, or, or areas that were explored by different founders and OD uh, practitioners um, and fathers of OD, you know, we moved from the group dynamics process um, through to understanding how OD itself got termed as a terminology, moving through the Tavistock Institute, looking at the natural beha the human behaviors, the whole concept of change agents. I mean, of the change methodologies, we never understand why they don't work. We can't align people to change. It's just nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. People create change. They're either passionate about it, they either buy into a purpose and believe in it, or they don't. Thinking we can have people manipulate them in some change agent way, I just, just think it's just not, not the way to go. Um, and why we've seen so much of the change processes, change management processes failing. Moving through to the human relations movement, um, which is all about people in work, creating harmonious work environments, better, better workspaces, um, socio-technological systems thinking, moving more towards understanding the link between systems. The first time a system starts to creep in is linking the link between systems and other social factors and looking at efficiencies and effectiveness, improvements and morale. Then into the whole survey methodologies, um, survey feedback and action research, um, unstructured group laboratory training and action learning, uh, planned, OD is a planned process of change, you know, something that we can predict in a linear manner, and businesses follow the same linear format. Same linear format, you know, strategic planning, do our strat planning, 
go into a bit of change, think about the future, look where we currently are, map out the projects, one, two, three, four, five, and put a bit of change management, engage the people, align them to purpose, or align them to the change, and then we have it happening. And then we understand why how many of those change processes actually landed up failing. And then moving towards more general systems thinking, which I think is still applied now and will be applied, but in different ways um, from what perhaps it was applied. And many of these will be applied, but in different ways going forward. Through to organizational effectiveness, complexity theory, which has been eclectic. And I'd like to suggest that the future growth is going to be more, move us more from a passive diagnostic analytical role and then trying to implement the actual research kind of solutions to a role where we're actually going to be required to shape to form, to disrupt, to provoke, to, to drive, to embed technologies in our OD processes versus us being facilitators of the process. And that's a shift. We're going to stop taking this passive backseat and actually become more of the drivers and enablers of the process for our business executives and for our partners. And if we don't do that, we will become even more irrelevant or become irrelevant. And the key for that for the OD practitioner is really saying, how do we positively impact, given this disruption, given this world that we're moving into, that we know is coming, we don't know the speed, we get a feel for it, but given what we know, how do we start to actually help people to understand the meaning of them, of this for them, as individuals, as organizations, as societies, and as humanity? And how do we create a planet that evolves the human order into something that's different in a space that is not necessarily fearful, but in a way that actually benefits people through the disruptive technologies themselves, relieves us of the, the lower order works and, and enables us to achieve higher order works. So I'd say to the HR executives and OD executives, it really is time that we stop apologizing that we are what we are. We, we have a seat at the table, we're invited into our clients and into our organizations when we're there, we need to understand that we are really looking at systems change in a completely different way. That the system is way broader than just the systems the way we've understood it because the change itself is changing so fast. And so we need to drive continuous disruption in business and people. We need to be doing the both. We need to disrupt business. We need to provoke. We need to be disruptioneers. We need to take on that label. We need to stop being scared and apologetic for it. And if we understand business and we understand people, we have absolutely no reason not to say what we want to say when we need to say it and, and add value in the process. Um, the role of the strategic partner is, 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 is certainly is changing. And um, if we look at looking at some of the key aspects of some of those things that we can do, what we can do now is really look at being a strategic position of the business. And I believe that that strategic position needs, means we need to drive early processes. We need to drive them into new OD processes into the business that takes from the old, but builds on using the technologies itself. We might build a, um, artificial intelligence into our methodologies and into our implementations. Um, we need to help our clients develop transcendent journey maps so they can shift from the linear into the exponential, but still maintaining their base, but at the same time, start thinking a lot more radically about how the world could evolve and how the world could change and, and what it's going to look like and the roadmap that needs to be built with it. We need to become credible activists, um, technological, uh, from the technology uh, proponents, proponents of, of technology. And what do we mean by activists? Stop sitting back and saying we're just facilitators. We actually need to advocate and look at how that creates um, the future fit people models, what those models are going to look like. How do we create a space that people can optimize their, their purpose of being human without having to do the begrudging work that they don't necessarily want to do, but almost in a Maslow's hierarchy of way where they can almost achieve um, that, that um, um, the highest order um, self-optimization or personal optimization, top optimization, I can't remember what it was, <laughs> the, the top level order of, of being. Um, and design specific models that can span both the now and the future. And then we need to take on the role of being a capability builder. And to me, that's the most important right now. Because this language is unfamiliar to many people, most people, and they think that we, we, we kind of from coming from a different planet, many of us, um, we need to start building that capability. So we need to start looking at what does it mean? What does it mean to have a, a culture of innovation? What is, how do we build the capability to start talking with this language, to start engaging with the concept, to start exploring how we can implement them in, a, in an ideas lab and create stuff and then implement in our businesses in order to create that um, exponential growth. Yeah. And then how do we, how do we develop the, the, the competencies, the, the, the executive competencies, 
our organizational capabilities, that we start to develop organizational capabilities that extend beyond what is currently known and our current ways of doing things. Um, through to the change champion role, where we really start to assess readiness. What is our readiness for this in our organization? So, but we do do it in an uh, only type of diagnostic. We, we have something that we call a, a, a TQ assessment, a trans, a, 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 a basically a transcendence quotient, measure transcendence quotient, how ready we are for massive dis disruption and for that transcendence in the journey. How, how prepared are we? How much do we know about what's coming our way? And then facilitate business strategies and people strategies. We do need to be the facilitator still in the strategic uh, role, but as a but, but not just the facilitator, also being a thought leader at the same time. So it's wearing multiple hats within almost some sessions. And plan and build the creations, uh, creates the cultures of innovation. Um, and that brings in, uh, I think it was Jeremy's question, the whole issue around diversity, the understanding of diversity. The understanding of abundant mindsets, the part of the capitalist problem that we have in the world at the moment is based on, this, in my opinion, based on a, a, a perception of, of um, haves and haves nots and based on exceptional wealth and exceptional poverty and based on a view of scarcity. So because something's scarce, it means it, 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 it becomes competition for it. And we need to shift those mindsets towards understanding what does it mean to become abundant? What is an abundant mindset? Equally need to start building some of those capabilities in terms of um, some of the, the competencies that are required from executives, curiosity, collaboration, collaboration, continuous learning. I also just want to quickly say that, and I know I'm running out of time, um, that our, our nature of our training and development is going to shift radically. Our learning institutions are not going, already are shifting the MOOCs, open universities, et cetera, et cetera. But it's going to be much more learner driven and rather, and, and rather than um, given by the educational institution uh, to the learner in the way that we learn and, and the way we train people. Yes. Dan, uh, we have about one minute left, but I just, for those who want to hang on for a few minutes, um, I think you, you could probably have a few more minutes if you'd like, Stan. Sure, I definitely um, would. I'll be on for another okay. three, four minutes. I'm okay, Stan, I just wanted yes. to let you know that Roland um, shared that this means the OD practitioner, and I would say HR as well, they have to become a bit stronger in use yes. of self. Absolutely. To engage the leaders in the C-suite and others in organizations more forcefully. Roland, 100%. And as I said, we don't need to apologize for that. Why do we need to? The accountants don't apologize. Why do we need to? So absolutely 100%. We are business partners and we do understand, we do actually understand business. Um, so we're not experts in business, but we can help the businesses to think through their solutions through what we do. So, so Roland also shared that this means that we're going to have to learn a bit more about the businesses in which we consult. <laughs> well, I've always said, I've, uh, as a disruptor in my first career, my first, first job I ever had, I got told I wasn't suited to HR. And when I asked why, they said, because you understand, you, you're too business driven. Right. <laughs> uh, if you don't understand business, you shouldn't be in HR and you should, certainly shouldn't be in OD. Right. Um, so the, the role should shift towards an HR innovator, integrator, and certainly a proponent of uh, technology, technology proponent. Some of our, um, some of my colleagues and friends, I know one of them is actually on the site at the moment. Um, is really looking at the digitization of HR from the beginning to end. So how do you digitize the whole HR process? What are the apps that are involved? Moving away from transactional type of things into a digitized mode so we can get rid of all this uh, non-value adding processes that move beyond an ERP SAP type of solution into something that's different. So we need to embrace some functional use of AI and disruptive tech also in our own um, delivery. And I think probably for me, the biggest, biggest role is to act and to change is to hold that space of the duality, to really help businesses and our business partners to understand this language and the fact that it's okay to be in the both at this point in time, because business is unusual, but it's still continuing in the linearity. We're still growing in that world. In, you know, in, in the late 1990s, we spoke about the dot-com bubble, it was gonna blow and, you know, internet was gonna collapse, et cetera. There was a dot, you know, all the dot-com companies, many of them failed. And everyone said, yeah, they're the doom blue, the, the naysayers, you know, it's happened. Well, it's a blip on the radar screen in the bigger scheme of things. So we really need to think that, that even the changes that are coming, and even if there's negativity and some stuff that's going to happen, it's not going to stop the change process from happening. 
Um, and we need to really help, I think we need to look at that in the linear space, but at the same time, help them build the new exponential space, the people space, the business models, um, and source. So if you need help, look for external journey guides as your partners in this process. Um, consciously, my advice to every HR person is consciously build your personal knowledge and skills every day, join networks, learn, become part of the ISODC, um, disrupt now, really. Uh, prevent us from becoming dinosaurs in the way that we are. Um, and let's, let's really look at new ways of working. And let's find those new ODHR space. Um, things like shifting the C-suites, learning through different ways of learning, different labs, different languages. Let's help them think differently and, and equip people for a new tech savvy workspace as opposed to a manual based workspace. Just quickly to kind of end off um, some of the competencies that are really going to shift in the executive space and also in the space of the ODHR practitioner. Obviously those foundational literacies are going to be there as a given, but I think some new competencies are quickly emerging and that are challenging the C-suite and HR OD people. The need to be certainly exceptionally creative to be able to think and link dots that haven't even been thought about yet. Um, the whole way of communicating, building a collaborative models, working with your what was your previous enemy to create something that's new, um, creative thinking, the whole issue about being curious, um, using initiative, being persistent. And those are capabilities we need to build in our organizations amongst our executive. And that requires lifelong learning. The view that you can just go into a university and do a short program or a short course or a long, long three-year degree and come out is gone. You know, lifelong learning requires us to be on our feet all the time. Um, I just want to say, play, have fun, um, journey, mistakes. We all get to make mistakes. There unfortunately are no paint by number two kits that say step one, step two, step three. Um, let's be prepared to fail forward. And uh, I just thank you for the time and for this opportunity. Stan, uh, thank you so much. Everybody's still left in the room. <laughs> um, Jerry Glover, um, Dr. Jerry Glover says, uh, cultural dilemmas are all about duality. Right? Oh, they are. This is what it's all about. And the cultural dilemmas are not only just across organizations that are operating globally, but they're also amongst different cultures in terms of the way people use language and words and the way they're interpreted. And I would suggest that those cultural dilemmas are going to take on a different form when robots are become citizens of the world. That's going to take completely new different meaning, which we haven't a clue what it's going to look like. But yeah, culture, culture. And, and also the fact that the new worlds of models of work are going to require people to work in different organizational cultures at the same time, because we might not be working in one organization. So Stan, we've had so many thank yous uh, in the chat room. Just, uh, I think you've uh, given some folks some new things to think about. I know you've given me some new things to think about. So thank you so much for that. Um, 